annual time at Heritage Conference, which uh, has made quite a journey over the years. Um, this year we feature heat, um, one uh, of our innovations, Born of Fire, is a key uh, cornerstone of our, our conversation this morning in West Portland. And uh, last year we were able to surround ourselves with a fabulous Coleman factory administration building. Um, and in that environment, soak in the day's theme. Um, today, we're surrounded by art in this wonderful facility, the South Shore Center for the Arts. Um, I would, uh, uh, I think what I'd, I'd like to do is introduce our host. Uh, my name, by the way, is Mark Bowman. I'm the president of the Climate Heritage Partnership, but I would like to introduce our host, John Kane of the South Shore. Thank you, Mark. You're taller than I am. <laughs> Most people are. Well, I, I already know at least a third of you in this room. Um, you're people who are involved with our Regional Arts Council here in Northwest Indiana, or you're people who are, uh, that we give money to, or you're people who give money to us, and which is always nice. Um, I wear a couple of different hats. I became the executive director here in 1993, shortly after the Art Center opened. Uh, the Center for Visual and Performing Arts is actually owned, uh, technically owned, by Community Foundation of Northwest Indiana, which also owns the hospital here in Munster and a couple of other hospitals here in Northwest Indiana. And it's sort of through the largesse of, of the Community Foundation that we're all here. <clears throat> and when this building opened in, in 1989, it provided a permanent home for uh, the regions at that time, the two largest arts organizations in the region were the Northwest Indiana Symphony Orchestra and uh, Northern Indiana Arts Association, which is now called South Shore Arts. And um, so the build, we had uh, the symphony operated out of the little storefront in Whiting and performed in various venues throughout our region. And uh, Northern Indiana Arts Association wasn't even in the storefront. It was kind of around the corner from the storefront here in Munster, in this nondescript little building. I always used to say, next to carpet lab. But now there is no more carpet lab. <laughs> so you can't go by that anymore. But in any event, those were you know, the olden days. And uh, our organization actually started out in 1936 with uh, an annual, what became in 1944, an annual art exhibit in uh, the hat department, the ladies' hat department, at Minus Department Store. <laughs> Every, for the two weeks after Easter, they, after they put away the ladies' hats, they had a competition that uh, it was called Salon Show, and that's the exhibit that's up right now, too. This is the 71st annual uh, edition of the Salon Show, and every year we raise uh, uh, and, and distribute to uh, the award-winning artist $10,000 in prizes, so it's something we're proud of. And uh, you're welcome to take a catalog and come back in the back of the gallery uh, before you go today. Um, so we're, we're thrilled to be here. Uh, the Community Foundation gift uh, to the arts amounts to something like $20 million over between the building, uh, the, the, the creating this building, helping to sustain the organizations to some extent. Um, before this building existed, there was no professional theater here in Northwest Indiana, but that began with this building uh, and the theater at the center. So, um, uh, and then of course we have the Brower Museum in Porter County, the Lebesnik Center for the Arts in Michigan City, and um, so th these, th these places have really given the arts a home that they never had before. They put the arts on the map in Northwest Indiana, so to speak. So it's, and this is very exciting, one of our strategic goals continues to be uh, to create uh, connections between our area and Chicago, and so we're really thrilled you're here. Thanks. So let me uh, say a couple of housekeeping things um, to orient you to the day a little bit, and your packets, and the room. Um, um, if you need the facility, straight out through the gift shop and to the right towards the theater, and you'll find them. Also, this space, uh, we're trying to work with, uh, trying to show something here, and also your comfort out there. Um, as I stand here, I see some places more towards the middle. Um, if, you, if you'd like to move, please feel free, or when the time comes, uh, just move your chairs and come towards the middle as we go. We're going to be eating in here 
uh, later on. We'll set up uh, food over there and we uh, can have lunch right here. Um, we'll watch our timing as carefully as we can uh, uh, because we have a, a, also a busy afternoon uh, bus tour and actually the bus tour begins with a little tour of this facility and John will lead us through a few things in here uh, starting from the back middle of the room at, at 1.30. Uh, uh, that's the main, oh, I would also like to show you your packet. There's a number of things in here. First thing is art and heritage. An interesting concept for a group who uh, gathered themselves around environmental issues and around economic development issues and uh, cultural history and historic preservation. But as we've investigated this question, really triggered by some conversations from last year's conference, uh, we realized that these links are, are deeper and stronger than we may think and are really an opportunity to work exploring more. And I really appreciate John's uh, remarks in that regard. Um, you'll see also right up front on the left is a statement of support. It's a Cabinet Heritage Partnership about which I'll say more later. It is a bi-state organization that does try to bring together <laughs> Northwest Indiana and the southern part of Chicago in the goal of um, lifting up the region's uh, cultural and natural resources. One way to do so is the concept of something called the National Heritage Area. I'll say more about that later, but if you support this idea and you hear more about it during the day, and we'll have some, much more to say around noon, just before lunchtime, I would encourage you to um, sign this. There's a box in the back by Madeline Tudor. Um, everybody should know is actually one of the region's greatest resources right there. And um, sign that and put it there. Uh, other things in here include some things put together to explore the concept of arts and heritage areas, the way different heritage areas have uh, drawn on the arts. Um, drawn on the arts, we have bios of our presenters. You'll see here also, this is relatively cut off the presses about a month ago. It's a, it's a guidebook for the region. Uh, I think you'll enjoy this very much. There is a updated version that is being kept online, and the people who put this together um, are eager to be sure that the online version reflects uh, the most up-to-date links and uh, references to other things. And uh, so give it a good close look. I think you can see that it begins to accomplish the goal of something that gets people out into the resources of this region and shows you some of the potential. Uh, various things that I should declare. One is that I'm an employee of the Field Museum of, uh, in Chicago, and the museum has been very interested in this region for more than a century. Our collections are full of cultural and natural resources that are collected across the region, and we continue to engage in the part of the, uh, on behalf of the region as a region that tries to ignore the state lines work as much as possible. And um, our uh, key staff from here have done a fabulous job of putting things together, and you'll be meeting some of them as the day goes forward. But that's sort of my uh, position in all of this. Uh, you'll see the, the itinerary for the tour, and also a map that some of you might find a little bit familiar of the bi-state region. So, uh, I just want to show you a couple of things. I, I, I just came in yesterday from a conference in, in Washington, and it, was, it struck me that I should share a couple of images with you real quickly before we go forward. So let's do that first one. So this is the Cary Furnace in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I was at a conference session with uh, friends from other heritage areas, and Anna Fogel is here today from the Illinois and Michigan Canal. Uh, Heritage Area, the 30th anniversary of the pioneering heritage area in the country is being observed this year. Um, hopefully later, I hope later this morning, Paula Robinson will join us. Paula is with the Black Metropolis effort. It's not been designated to perform a heritage area yet, but it's in the south side of Chicago, between downtown and about uh, Hyde Park. 
So this is the Rivers of Steel National Heritage Area. And I was at a session where others were talking about what their heritage areas have been able to accomplish in Pittsburgh, in Cleveland, and Akron, in uh, Augusta, Georgia, and in, in eastern Pennsylvania. I, I took my family to the Cary Furnace this summer, and they went willingly, and I spent money there. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to know this, and they enjoyed it. And my, my um, uh, children of the millennium had a great time. As you walk up to the fence, you'll see this sign. Please don't graffitiize this area. But what they've discovered at Rivers of Steel, go to the next one, is uh, the opportunity to do art in other places on the site. So they establish a, a conversation with the local um, artists who, and they've hired somebody who teaches uh, graffiti art and the different regional styles, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles styles, and uh, have actually worked this into their programming. So they, they saved the resource, they did what they could to get the place to be um, saved, and then what came was art. Thanks. So that the artists even work the logo of Rivers of Steel. I haven't seen the logo of the China Heritage Partnership yet on any walls around here, but maybe something. <laughs> um, in on the blast furnace is this little uh, cutout silhouette, and all through the blast furnace are these things. Next one, and then the big crowning achievement is this. Before they actually owned the site and secured it is this, uh, it's called the Cary Deer, and it's made out of conduit and uh, wire found on site. It's a, uh, it's a tall thing that was built by a set of artists who broke into the place and did this. And now, uh, Rivers of Steel has embraced this work, and in fact, uh, tonight I was just uh, saying, on WQED in Pittsburgh, uh, will be um, a TV show called The Cary Deer Project, and it's about the, um, creation of this, and then the, uh, the current effort to restore it and make sure it's stable and to tell the story of its production. Um, this place has become the center for all sorts of activities. Movies are made there, Pittsburgh Ballet films there, and the next thing you know, we've got all kinds of things happening. The other thing about the Cherry Furnace is, and about the Rivers of Steel Heritage Area effort, again, they tried to establish the resource and now they're the end point of the Great Allegheny Passage. This is a trail from Pittsburgh to Washington, D.C. Um, on the site itself, there's some important conservation work going forward as, as nature is sort of reclaiming the site. They've got a, a landscape architect in Philadelphia working. And again, all these things begin to work in concert. But Dorothy, I don't think we're in Pittsburgh anymore. Um, we're in the Cayman region. And we have our own issues, and our own resources. Um, I think uh, we've got an opportunity here to, to think outside the box, but also to focus. And so the message today is about tapping our creative energies and then to, to move things into some kind of production. As you look around you, the great efforts that have, that have happened uh, from artists who can uh, visualize the thing, move it onto the canvas or the sculpture or out onto the landscape. Um, so I'm excited about this. I thank everybody for coming. I'm happy to talk with you individually as we go through the day. Um, you can find me. Um, and uh, what I'd like to do is introduce my colleague, uh, Mario Longoni, uh, from, the, from the museum staff, who has been a key member of a team that for the last year has been convening groups of people to talk about local history, about local art. And Mario will get us started on the next step of thinking about it. So thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. So we've seen a little bit of what's, you know, some of the art that's connected to the heritage area in Rivers of Steel, and in a few minutes, then Judith O'Toole from the West Wallow Museum is going to also look at that question a little more deeply. 
But I just want to get us started this morning in thinking a little bit about the Calumet region um, and the arts in the Calumet region. So what I'm going to ask you to do is you got those cards on the table there. If you want to make sure that each person at the table gets a card and then a writing implement, we put some extras at the table and we probably, probably brought some with them as well. What I want you to do to start here is just write down one kind of art in the Calumet region. Just don't overthink it. Just one kind of art that you find in the Calumet region. <coughs> Something that artists are doing, something that you've experienced there, seen in the region. Okay, and then I want you to think for a second and write down what about the region, and you can pick which of these words works for you, what in the region supports that art form, feeds it, or gives it shape? place to go and they have crossed the line 
So you'll find artists from uh, Southeast Chicago and Northwest Indiana working in cooperation, which is Roman's dream. I'm reminded of the smoke stacks across the marsh, and um, and I think of the industrial history of the site, areas of abandonment, and history of disinvestment, and how that needs to change. One more. Um, it's an art form. It's stained, fused, and blown glass. There are a number of people who practice that in the region. And the support for that comes from galleries, museums, um, and also the natural surroundings, which influence the designs in the art. And frankly, also the occupational history and steel making, because some of these artists use steel as um, part of the uh, structures for, for glass. You know, I feel like I'm going to come way over here, because I feel like I'm collecting this side of the room. Anyone over here want to? Okay. I think a really obvious one is, uh, and because it's so ubiquitous, is dunes paintings. And uh, obviously it was influenced by the dunes. And people coming here like Frank Dudley and uh, artists from Chicago uh, back in the 20s and teens and 30s and setting up little homes and little bungalows out in the dunes, which of course are all gone now because it's all been we heard about performing and visual arts and um, public art, sculpture, all these things. So it's this breadth that you would see anywhere else, right, in the Calumet region. And yet there's these particular unique things people cited, the proximity to a really large metropolis which feeds the art scene in the Calumet region, and yet there's a localness, there's a, there's a town feel in each place. So there's a place-basedness, too, that I heard in what people were saying. And then there's the heritage elements people were talking about, whether it's natural heritage or industrial heritage, and that at times informs the sort of content that goes into the art as well. So keeping these kinds of ideas in mind then, um, I want to go ahead and bring on our, our keynote speaker for the day, Judith O'Toole, who's director and CEO of the Westmoreland Museum of American Art. And what she's going to talk about is that Westmoreland has a strong relationship with the Rivers of Steel National Heritage Area and holds a Born of Fire collection of the paintings of Southwest Pennsylvania steel industry. And she's going to talk about the relationship between art and the heritage area, how art is used to ground and promote the heritage, uh, the Rivers of Steel Heritage Area, and how art is used for development and redevelopment of the area. And so then again, we'll, we'll talk a little bit again afterward and see if some of those connections have been enriched. So, Judith? <laughs> at the Westmoreland Museum of American Art that re relates to the steelmaking heritage uh, in southwestern Pennsylvania and particularly in Pittsburgh. Um, and a little bit about our partnership with Rivers of Steel, uh, which is a tremendous asset to the area. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the museum uh, first. Uh, we were founded in 1959 uh, by a woman who lived in Greensburg. And let me tell you, Greensburg is 35 miles south east of the city of Pittsburgh. Um, and she, Mary Marshall Woods, felt that it was too difficult for everybody to travel to Pittsburgh to see art. And so she thought her community should have an art museum. But she didn't have a collection. And most people that organize art museums uh, have collections because they've got to put their stuff somewhere. Uh, so my colleague um, and the first director of the museum, Paul Chu, decided that the emphasis of the museum should be in American art. That's a whole other story, but it was a very advantageous thing. 
uh, for the museum and for the region. He also started collecting art that belonged in the region. So rather than being a mid-sized museum, uh, we sort of say we're geographically challenged and that we're not in a large metropolitan area. Uh, but instead of trying to be the Whitney or the MoMA or the whatever of Greensburg, he decided to root himself in the place. And so he started collecting 19th century landscape paintings from artists who traveled out of the smoky city in order to get away from that and um, into the woods near Johnstown, Pennsylvania and record the pristine uh, wilderness of Pennsylvania before industry gobbled it all up. Um, when I came on board, uh, I am from Minneapolis uh, originally and I spent some time in uh, north, northeastern Pennsylvania, uh, but I was completely new to the spectacle of the steel industry and uh, Paul had started to acquire few paintings by artists who were recording that spectacle. And as an outsider, uh, not being able to witness anymore the fire along the river that was the steel industry in Pittsburgh, uh, I started to uh, think about, well, there must be some other uh, paintings out there and things that relate to this. So uh, it, it has uh, become a, a major part of our collection, and we've dubbed it Born in Fire. And um, you'll hear a little bit more about that uh, later. Uh, I could have the next. So just a little bit about the uh, history of Pittsburgh. Uh, by the beginning of the 19th century, the iron industry had really started to take root in Pittsburgh. I don't know, do we need some lights? How can you see the slides OK? All right. I'm used to speaking in the dark. I'm an art historian, so <laughs> speaking in bright light is really alien to me. <laughs> anyway, um, the first rolling uh, mill powered by a steam engine was established in Pittsburgh in 1812, and from then on, the number of steel mills increased very rapidly. Uh, by 1817, Pittsburgh was a large urban area, and the city boasted four glass factories, three breweries, two potteries, a grist mill, a steam engine factory, a nail mill, cotton and woolen factories, and four printing establishments. Uh, so these are the early years of the Industrial Revolution, and the city of Pittsburgh grew, grew exponentially, uh, drawing people from all over the world to uh, its workplaces uh, for employment in the new world. Uh, the city, however, was not the beautiful city that we know today. The streets were muddy and poorly lit, sometimes only by the pitch fires that were set to try and kill the source of repeated outbreaks of cholera in the densely inhabited city. And smoke and filth from the factories added to the dirty and unsavory environment, yet Pittsburgh continued to attract these immigrant families. And of course, among those immigrant families came artists. It's a big surprise to people, but um, uh, the, the children of many of the immigrants were interested in the arts, and so uh, we started to establish an artistic community in Pittsburgh. When Charles Dickens came to Pittsburgh in 1842, he dubbed it hell with the lid blown off. You may have heard that before. He said, it certainly has a great deal of smoke hanging about it and is famous for its ironworks. I will have to concede it is beautifully situated on the Allegheny River, and of course we know it's on the Allegheny and the Monongahela River, um, and those two rivers flow together to create the Ohio at the point. So by 1860, steel meat making had very deep roots in the city, uh, and in the next decade, Pittsburgh would boast 33 rolling mills. By 1880, the city's 16 enormous steelworks manufactured one quarter of the country's rolled iron, and two-thirds of its crucible steel, steel. We like to say in Pittsburgh, and I know when I was in Sheffield, um, it, it disagreed, but uh, Pittsburgh being the steel-making capital of the world, an unrivaled industrial giant while the steel and iron industries grew and earned for the city the epitaph of the smoky city. We can go to the next one. Let's start looking at some art. Um, this is by Martin Leiser. It's one of the earliest paintings in our collection, and it, it shows the um, uh, uh, the fire that was, I'm looking for the name of it, Union Station Riot from 1877. It, um, this was uh, a riot that occurred when uh, the engineers were required to pull two locomotives instead of one, which meant one of every two engineers were out of a job. 
So this was one of the early uh, uh, workers' riots in the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, it's a fairly good-sized painting. It's 20 by 30 inches. Uh, what it shows is the very immediacy of the artist. He was actually there on site. The whole city woke up to see the spectacle. And um, he was on a rooftop where he recorded this in, in many small sketches and then created this larger piece uh, in his studio. And you see all the ashes being blown into the sky by the fierce uh, wind. You see, um, I don't know, how well can you see this live? You can see the silhouette of the city in the background. Um, go ahead. Uh, this, on the other hand, is a very small painting on panel, and uh, it shows the Jones and Laughlin uh, mill on the Mon River uh, with the Eliza furnace across the river from it. Uh, Leiser was one of the artists that came to the United States. He was the son of German immigrants, um, and uh, like many uh, artists who were in America, he had to go back to Europe to study art, so he went back to Munich and Dusseldorf. Uh, but he came back to Pittsburgh and became the Dean of Pittsburgh Artists. He was very influential. He befriended Andrew Carnegie and convinced Carnegie to establish an art school along with the um, Pittsburgh Institute that he was creating, which is now the Carnegie Mellon University. Um, uh, this is, a, of course, a very somber palette. It has uh, beautiful brushwork. Uh, uh, lots of uh, sort of freedom of expression in it. You can tell that it's a small sketch that he would have worked up into a larger painting. Um, in our collections, we try and have one great painting by Mary Cassatt or uh, John Singer Sargent or whatever, but we try and have great depth in these regional collections. So we collect everything from these very small sketches to uh, large finished pieces. <coughs> So here is an artist named Joseph Pinnell, who's also, uh, I'm sorry, he was attracted to Pittsburgh. So we have two things going on here. We have artists who moved to Pittsburgh and painted uh, the steel industry. We also have artists who became drawn to the steel industry. Now think about the uh, 19th century, late 19th century in American painting, and you conjure up images of woodlands, certainly. Uh, if there are people in the woodlands, there is likely to be nymphs uh, frolicking. Uh, so still very mired in uh, earlier style painting, and the idea of actually painting the gritty world around you uh, was very new and extraordinary and not very well embraced actually by the uh, academies and sort of the official uh, art world. So Joseph Pinnell, who was very interested in uh, what he called the wonder of work, traveled around the, uh, the, the United States uh, creating images for a book that he would do. Uh, with that title, Pictures of the Wonder of Work, which was published in 1916. And what he said at Pittsburgh was this. He said, way down below the level road in which I stood, way on the opposite side of the river, Pittsburgh lies a dark, low mass, hemmed in by its rivers, lorded by its hills. In the hollow, the smoke hangs so dense, often I could not see the city at all. But once a while, a breeze falls on the town, and the great white skyscrapers come forth from the thick black cloud, and the effect is glorious. The glorification of work for Pittsburgh is the work city of the world. So Pinnell was one of America's leading illustrators. It was very important that he um, connected in this manner to Pittsburgh. Uh, his book included four etchings, the most ever of um, any city that he visited, and he chose to book to put Pittsburgh number three that you see on your right on the um, cover of the book. Uh, he used uh, all sorts of uh, printmaking materials. This is an aqua tint that you see in Pittsburgh number three, and that medium, if you know it, is particularly adept in using uh, in, in creating these gray tones and this atmosphere that was so much Pittsburgh. So here we have another one. This is Homestead Steelworks, which was purchased by Andrew Carnegie in 1883, one of the largest steel complexes in the region and really the jewel in Carnegie's crown. Uh, you see the um, rank and the hot metal bridge, which is still there um, and uh, leads over to uh, an, an area uh, where rivers of steel is becoming increasingly involved, uh, but connecting the mill to the Cary Glass furnace across the Monongahela. Um, next one. 
Uh, oftentimes, the uh, artists would actually, uh, when they were working in the print medium, they wouldn't bother to flip their skit, uh, sketch. So oftentimes, and you'll see a painting a little later in my presentation, uh, where the artist says it's on the Mon River, but it's actually on the Allegheny River because you know the, the image was flipped. Uh, but here we see um, another work by Pinnell. Um, uh, so in describing this, he commented on how uh, the fact that work has character, just as a tree has, of course, uh, um, alluding to the uh, landscape school that was so popular. Um, but how much more impressive is a row of blast furnaces, oil wells, and coal breakers than trees? <laughs> Next. Uh, this is a wonderful painting that we found at auction in Philadelphia and brought back to Pittsburgh. This is an artist named Colin Campbell Cooper, uh, who was um, born in the 1850s and, and died in uh, 1937. Uh, he was the son of a wealthy surgeon um, who went to art school. He studied in Europe at the Academy Julian. Uh, his um, initial work was also sort of landscapes and nymphs, but when he came back to New York City, uh, to study, he caught this sort of fervor, uh, and some of you might know about the Ashcan School and uh, other artists in New York at the early part of the 20th century who said, you know, why are we still going out into the woodlands? Let's capture this very vibrant life that is in the city around us. So uh, this is uh, an image that is very popular uh, with our visitors. Uh, Cooper uh, came to uh, Pittsburgh. There were several art entities that would bring about 20 artists into the area uh, a couple times a year. The, the jury for the Carnegie International and then the jury for the Associated Artists of Pittsburgh Exhibition. So these artists would come in and it wasn't like the days now where we just slip a disc into a computer and, and look and do our jurying. They actually stayed for about two weeks and examined the work very carefully had a lot of camaraderie between the artists, and they would go out and paint and paint. So every once in a while, we'll find uh, Cooper um, and artists like him who were more famous for their images, in Cooper's case, of New York. Uh, but he happened to paint a picture of Pittsburgh. So our goal is to bring all those paintings back to the Pittsburgh area. Uh, I'm going to hop down a minute. <coughs> I'm used to looking at the paintings when I talk, so we'll see how successful it might be without my notes. But um, you can see that it's a very realistic view of the city, and there's some wonderful detail. There are billboards, the beginning of billboards here. In this area, there's, there are tents and so on for uh, the homeless people or hobos who are connected with the railroad, which we see here. Uh, this is a landmark. It's a building at Duquesne University. So, that can always orient you in terms of where you are in Pittsburgh when you see that uh, uh, building of Duquesne. Um, we have visitors that come to the museum. I have one great story briefly is that um, a Pittsburgher brought a friend from Philadelphia and they stood in front of this painting and the Pittsburgher said, oh, that's exactly what the sky looked like in Pittsburgh when I was growing up. Had this sort of, you know, rust red and dark gray and <clears throat> sort of sooty feel to it. The woman from Philadelphia and said, oh, how sad that must have been for you. And the woman from Pittsburgh said, oh, no, whenever we saw the sun, we knew something was wrong. <laughs> because the mills were not working. So a uh, really interesting thing. OK, go ahead. Uh, John Sloan, which uh, is, 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 is uh, I'm really bad with that. You see the name John Sloan. <laughs> who was a member of the Ashcan School, and um, it, the, uh, the academies in Pittsburgh often bring in artists from New York to teach for a period of time, uh, sometimes a semester, sometimes for several years, and so Sloan was one of the artists who was imported, and he made this wonderful uh, drawing of this uh, street urchin, or a student who's maybe scrambling over the fence to get to work, um, but you see deep into the valley, uh, the city, and how close uh, the families of the workers were to the mills. Uh, you'll see this in some of the other images too, but really living right alongside of the mills uh, and being part of that. Um, Charles Kyle Archer, a uh, photographer who took a more romantic view of the mills, and it's interesting to see how these artists do decipher the take they're going to have on, on the gritty uh, scenes of Pittsburgh. 
Uh, obviously, this one is posed. Uh, the two boys, rather well dressed, are sort of gesturing to the industry that's um, far down the horizon there um, and uh, remarking who knows what. Again, sort of a storytelling uh, picture. Um, Archer was a, um, a chemist, and so he toy with different techniques uh, in photography and um, uh, came up with uh, this, this way of having it look very atmospheric, uh, very painterly in its approach to a photograph. So this is the big kahuna. This is Aaron Harry Gorson and maybe one of the artists that you might have heard of. Uh, the reason for his fame is that he left Pittsburgh and went to New York where all the action was and um, established a reputation there. But uh, he painted many, many beautiful uh, views of the mills, primarily at night. Uh, he was born in Lithuania, uh, came here with his parents in 1888, uh, and he lived in Pittsburgh um, from about 1900 to about 1920, uh, when he went to New York to seek his fame. He was um, trained in Paris, and so became very interested in the Impressionists and Post-Impressionists. and. He developed a very loose, rich, painterly uh, brush style, uh, and he favored the mills at night because they were beautiful at night. And um, if any, did anybody grow up in Pittsburgh here? Anybody? Oh, I, I, ah. For a couple of years. Okay. <laughs> did you? So do you remember? People will tell me that they would actually sit outside on Mount Washington or whatever, and you would look down, and you'd be gossiping with your, I don't know, seven great friend and looking at this spectacle that was Pittsburgh Steel um, with the fire belching out and the reflection on the river and the bridges and everything else. So um, there are actually some um, new books that are coming out um, from the University of Pittsburgh Press that record um, in, uh, reminiscences like that. And I always feel bad that I, I wasn't able to, sit, to see it in person. but. Uh, the nighttime scenes, of course, again, being very romantic, but we have all the elements here. Gorson has the corner of a, board, a barge, uh, the railroad, and uh, then, of course, the, the mill itself on the Mon River. Uh, this, again, is the Jones and Laughlin Mill. Most of the artists painted that uh, because of the bend in, of, of, in the river and the way the mill was situated. It, it just was aesthetically more pleasing, and um, so many of them painted from this vantage point. Next. So, uh, and I'll take the next two. So this just talks a little bit about how the artist talks to, uh, talk amongst themselves about uh, creating uh, the images of Pittsburgh, and here you see a photographer and Gorson relating to one another. A similar perspective, often with the barge and the mills in the distance, always with the river and the surface of the river. This is a rare, uh, day, more daylight scene by Corson. Again, though, you can see this very subtle, beautiful palette that he uses. And again, the focus is on the, the yellow fire and the, the grays of the mill and then the reflection on the river. Almost a Whistler-esque uh, image, uh, a small picture by Gorson. Uh, we have a good number of paintings by him in the collection that shows one of the bridges uh, in Pittsburgh with a, a tug or a boat um, coming underneath it. And then Isabella Furness. Uh, you notice, and I, you guys probably know way more about steel making than I do, but you know all the furnaces had women's names, so I'm sure there's a book about that somewhere. But this is Isabella. And um, again, painted um, on a five by seven board. So you can imagine the artist was actually situated somewhere um, with this little uh, travel set of oils. And um, this is probably one of the more uh, gritty pictures by Gorson of the mills. An interior of the mill, which is really rare, obviously. Um, the, uh, you, you don't want an artist just wandering around inside the mill. It's a little dangerous to do that. Also, artists really didn't have, uh, until you'll see some slides a little later on, uh, they weren't really interested in the mills in terms of the workers. Uh, if, if, yes, you've seen the ones that I've shown today, uh, there's really no evidence of the workers. It's really the, the mill itself uh, that the artists are interested in, and oftentimes um, they're using the mill as an armature to create a dramatic picture. 
Uh, so this is a rare view. Uh, again, there's no, no uh, sight of any worker, uh, but a dramatic um, view of, again, the, the fire and light um, it's inside. Go ahead. So auto cooler is the counterpart to Gorson. Otto Kuhler was a, um, the son of German immigrants, uh, and he was trained as an engineer, so when he painted the mills, he knew a little bit more about what he was talking about. So when he, when he, he, uh, he drew them, he drew them from the point almost of an illustrator, although this is really a remarkable uh, work that um, is uh, called the Valley of Work. And actually, when we first started pulling our uh, steel pictures uh, together, uh, we called the exhibition the Valley of Work. Uh, again, it's a um, it's a it's on a steel plate, so the artist was able to take full advantage of the medium in order to create these wonderful atmospheric plumes of smoke that rise up about above the city. Uh, really, the kind of um, the, the the city is very small in relationship to the smoke that's being created around it. Uh, Cooler actually tried to study as a formal artist, and he went to the Dusseldorf Academy, but they kicked him out uh, after a couple weeks because he, uh, they said he had very little um, attention span, and um, they weren't really interested in somebody who was drawn to paint industry and um, machinery, which is really what he wanted to do. Next. This is a spectacular painting uh, that we acquired a number of years ago um, through the largesse of one of our patrons. Uh, and it was uh, discovered in upstate New York. Uh, these pictures, of course, with families travel all over the world. Um, and this is Steel Valley, uh, around 1925. Uh, again, this is a more realistic uh, look at what Pittsburgh looked like. Uh, people will tell me that the river was this sort of dull gold and that you couldn't see anything beyond that. Uh, and you see that the sun this is probably painted at noon, but the sun is really not able to break through the uh, atmosphere around Pittsburgh. Um, next one. Uh, Cooler, because he was interested in the equipment and the machinery and everything, um, was able to get into the, some of the mills. And this is an interior view of the old Dunn Norton plant. Um, uh, the, now the Allegheny Drop Forge, and uh, so uh, he did get in. You can see the workers, and you see the forges. Uh, again, though, it's a beautiful, uh, almost sort of mosaic tile-like painting of um, the, the yellows and, and golds against the, the blue and the gray, and then the light coming in around it. Um, my colleague and I were called to uh, a lady's apartment shortly after this exhibition opened at the Westmoreland. She said, I have this painting that my husband commissioned, but I'm not really sure that it would fit in your collection, but if you'd like to come see it, you could. And we walked into her apartment in Pittsburgh, and this was the painting over the mantel. So we uh, almost dropped dead. Um, <laughs> and that was what I was, when I was driving my, what I call my mom mobile. It was a van and it had all sorts of blankets and stuff in it. And so um, she said, well, you can have your people come pick it up, you know, whenever you'd like. And I said, well, I don't know, I think I've got some stuff here. <laughs> so <laughs> we actually did walk out with it that day. Um, the next one. Uh, Cooler was very versatile in a number of different media. He worked in oil, he worked in printmaking, he worked in watercolor and gouache. And so you see here the Wabash Railroad Bridge, uh, which was built in 1904. It was to connect the Pittsburgh Terminal Railroad Company, um, basically in the heart of the city, to downtown Pittsburgh. Um, and then you can see also the, uh, he was very fascinated by uh, trains and eventually left Pittsburgh to go uh, um, uh, build locomotives in uh, the Midwest, uh, but you see in the watercolor uh, of Pittsburgh, the, the train is again very diminished in size because of the scale of the mill around it. Um, after he left Pittsburgh, he claimed to be haunted by the city. He said the rolling hills of Pittsburgh, the busy rivers, puffing and whistling trains, endlessly proceeding day and night. He said, I do my best to hold it in my work. Uh, so many of these artists continue to uh, paint, including Gorson when he left and went to New York, continue to paint uh, scenes of Pittsburgh 
because they were so embedded uh, in their vision. What am I doing on time here? So, so I'm just going to step down now and, and talk a little bit um, about these next few images uh, very briefly. But if I could have the next, and if I'm in anyone's way, just tell me. Uh, this is by Joanna Nobles Woodwell. Her father, Joseph Woodwell, was trained in the Barbizon School and one of, was one of those artists who left the Smoky City to go to Johnstown area. They were actually called the Scout Level Artists. You'll hear about them more in about 10 years when I finish my book on them. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, the younger generations of artists, um, uh, again, uh, turned more toward the city and industry, and this is a beautiful uh, view by her, uh, Oil Wash. We found this at an auction in Boston, and I actually sent somebody up to take a look at it and acquire it. Composition is really lovely, starting more toward modernism now as we look to some of these artists that are uh, influenced um, more by Impressionism, post-Impressionism, and then more modern techniques. This is Ernest Lawson. Ernest Lawson was also a member of the Eight um, or the Ashcan School in New York, and he was one of the ones that came to uh, jury one of the exhibitions. Um, he had what was known as a crushed jewel palette. He would actually crush uh, the oil pigments and work them into the painting, and so this is really a sad uh, reproduction of a really tremendous picture. Um, Again, you can see this uh, vantage point high over the hills of Pittsburgh. Uh, he called it the um, Pittsburgh Mills on the Mon River, but this is actually the Allegheny River. Um, artists also, um, and it probably took me about four years, you know, after I moved to the area to figure out which was the Mon and which was the Allegheny, because, you know, they come together and uh, create the Ohio. Uh, most of the industry was on the, um, the, the Mon River. Next. This is Haley Lieber, another artist who came, and again, these are things that we found all around the country and brought back to the Pittsburgh area. Here you can see the real march of bridges uh, along the Allegheny River and the uh, industry. Now, I, assuming all you know, but of course, this is all gone. Um, when you uh, drive into downtown Pittsburgh now, and I'll show an image at the end, um, the industry is completely gone, um, flanking the banks of um, Oak Rivers, really. Uh, and unfortunately, unlike the great city of Chicago, even though I'm in Indiana, I know, but, uh, which made such great use of its uh, uh, waterfront, uh, unfortunately in Pittsburgh we've replaced most of the mills with industri other industrial buildings. Next. Uh, this is a sketch that we were lucky to find uh, that complements the painting by Lieber. Uh, this is a little bit more contemporary approach, uh, bordering a little bit on cubism. This is by Roy Hilton, who was an artist of the city and a very important uh, painter and uh, teacher at the Carnegie Institute called Winter Day. Uh, here you can see the workers' houses is really what he's focusing on and the topography of Pittsburgh, which is really astounding. Um, I'm from Minneapolis, so I'm used to flat. I'm a bike rider. Um, that's not really so easy anymore <laughs> here. And um, this is actually a sidewalk that turns into a staircase, um, which is very common in Pittsburgh, that the, the uh, sidewalk would just continue up the side of the mountain, but in the form of stairs. Another image by Roy Hilton, a rare one that shows the workers uh, entering the mill. Uh, and again, the interested in the workers and the plight of the workers in Pittsburgh. Elizabeth Olds was somebody, she worked for the WPA. Uh, she went all around the state of Pennsylvania and painted the uh, domestic life of workers. So you see this view uh, of the, the long underwear on the laundry line, uh, looking uh, a little bit white right now, but of course the smoke in the distance forebodes that the, uh, the clean wash is not going to be clean for very long. It also shows the, the mixing of the races in Pittsburgh, uh, which is something, again, that the artist uh, didn't get too involved with. When they did paint the workers, they were sort of anonymous figures, but by the 30s, we're starting to get, again, artists who are looking a little bit more closely at who the workforce is. Uh, this is a fabulous painting by Francis Comp 
paired off. Um, this is a portrait of his brother-in-law who worked in the mills. And he wanted to create uh, an iconic image of the steel worker. And the um, image, I think, comes off very well as that. Um, we see him here. He's got a rope cast across his soldier, uh, shoulder, um, really kind of a symbol of how tied he is to the industry, which we see in the background. He's holding elements that he's created in his work. And he's got that sort of dull stare looking forward, um, sort of deadened by the work that he does. Uh, his shoulder is powerful, but slumping a little bit. So a very compassionate and interesting portrait of a worker. We just acquired this Ernest Feeney a number of years ago. This is Night Ship Aliquippa, so outside of Pittsburgh. Um, again, the drudgery of the workers sort of moving toward the mill, almost um, automatons as they uh, walk toward the entrance. And again, the characteristic uh, smoke in the city. This is a Thomas Hart Benton uh, of Western Pennsylvania. It may or may not be Pittsburgh. We don't know for sure. Uh, again, uh, this is a strike uh, in 1933. Uh, we don't know exactly what strike it was, uh, but Benton, who was very interested um, politically uh, in the workers' movement, uh, but it's an unusual piece because if you know Thomas Hart Benton, he really painted scenes of farms and rolling hills and cows, etc. Uh, but passing through became interested. This is a really lovely pastel by, we're starting to collect work that we may not know who the artist is, but based on the quality of the work, we'll bring it into the collection. So this is, we think, Annie Campbell, uh, who was an Ohio artist, who painted this view of the south side, again with the mills and the fire. Really, they, um, just pointing out how many of the artists uh, incorporated the churches in the neighborhoods, uh, just accentuating how important religion was. Germans built one, and then the Italians built another, maybe right next door. Uh, really grand things that were the heart of the community. I love this one. This is a photographer, Clyde Hare, who we just lost recently, uh, the last steam train before it was replaced by diesel. And I love how the clouds are uh, mimicking the houses high up on the hill, a real Pittsburgh um, uh, characteristic, uh, almost like a toothy grin with the houses uh, perched up. Uh, so um, artists today are still painting the mills even though they're gone. Uh, they're painting them from photographs, which is interesting. Uh, we went through a whole thing in Pittsburgh when I arrived 20 years ago and I became interested uh, in the steel her heritage as seen through the eyes of artists. Uh, and nobody really wanted to talk about the steel industry. They were still embarrassed by it, you know. The, uh, they, w they weren't proud of it. Um, they, they didn't want to talk to people about it. It was really sort of a weird thing. I couldn't figure that out. Um, but then artists started uh, thinking about their, their history and their past and what built the city. And so these are two artists, uh, Ron Donahue and Craig McPherson. Uh, Ron, in particular, uh, you know, painting some things from um, photographs and other images. Uh, we now have a very active educational program in the museum where we have retired steel workers who talk to our students who come through and they talk about what it was like to be in the mill. They talk about the noise. Um, they talk about the pride that they had of being part of Pittsburgh Steel, the power of it. Uh, so it's really a great opportunity for them. Uh, we have children now who will say, after they've um, talked with the steel workers, well, you know, my grandpa is, is deaf, so maybe it was because he worked in the mills. And maybe that's why now, because it was so loud. So it's really great to have that impact on the uh, younger generation. And I have a few more slides, but I think I'm going to stop here. This is Mark Parrott, uh, another contemporary photographer. When the mills started to be torn down, he went around and photographed them. And uh, this one, again, in a little bit better light, you can see it more clearly, but he's captured the worker's house with the lights on, so it's the beginning of the evening. And then the mill here, looming behind it. You have the river, which is always the layer in Pittsburgh, and then beyond it, you have the modern city. So um, it's the, the end of the era, and actually I'll do one more, I think, because it, uh, this is Aaron Elderoy Gruber. 
Uh, and it's literally called End of the Era. Another photographer who is drawn to these big, hulking, empty edifices to capture them. And she used a particular lens in order to create this um, sort of semi-circular, but a very haunting, uh, very beautiful image. So uh, I will stop there, um, except to say that um, our work with Rivers of Steel um, uh, really occurred about uh, 10 years ago when we partnered with them, found out what they were doing uh, to preserve the steel industry. And we made a couple of trips because our collection went to uh, the Ruhr Valley in Germany. And we were really shocked to see how beautiful it, we shouldn't have been, you know, duh. But anyway, the, the Germans uh, preserved many of their mills and they reconverted them into different uses. And of course, we, America, we tear down and then we, you know, build back up again. Um, and so we, we traveled the exhibition and we worked with Rivers of Steel in interpreting uh, the images. And we're still working with them. Um, I actually flip through to the very last image, if you wouldn't mind. Well, this, oh, sorry. Well, this is Pittsburgh now. And I work with the Tourism Bureau and they make me do this because um, they want you to know that if you come to Pittsburgh, it's going to be a really beautiful experience, but you do see there's no evidence anymore uh, of, the, of steel making in Pittsburgh. And just one more slide. Uh, this is a view of the new museum that we're building. And uh, when we reopen it, we'll have some oral histories uh, from the steel workers that we're working with and also a lot of material that Rivers of Steel is, is helping us with. So um, after September 12, 2015, come visit me and uh, you'll see all this in person. So thank you very much for inviting me. So do people have any questions for Judith? How is the local response to the museum? It obviously is going to be, it's attracting the resources to expand, but uh, the cultural role that it is in the region now. Oh, uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, Pittsburgh, actually, in the 20 years I've been there, has really come alive culturally. Of course, it always had the, the Carnegie, but we have the Warhol now, we have the mattress factory. Uh, we have a lot of things going in the arts. We have the South Side, we have the North Side, we have Lawrenceville, uh, where artists are living. Um, our museum, I think, is very well supported because we are a museum of American art, and that's what makes us stand out. There are only three museums dedicated to American art in the state. The other two are in Philadelphia, and somebody said to me yesterday, oh, when I come to Philadelphia next, I'll come visit you in Pittsburgh. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, it's a very long state. I, you got to add about six and a half hours there to do that. Uh, but I think that people are very grateful uh, to our museum that we are uh, um, collecting in this area regionally and now collecting also um, regional uh, contemporary artists. Uh, because, and then setting them alongside quote, national, you know, nationally recognized artists and that distinguishes us and so um, we, we and Pittsburgh is a very strong philanthropic community that we benefit from uh, but we get a lot of the uh, layer of support uh, because of our subject matter so this last image here um, reminds me of a conversation I was just having a few nights ago about a really bold architectural statement that would reflect the region's heritage. It, it has to do with the Ford Calumet Environmental Center, which is built, would, would be built to a design by Jeannie Gang, who's a well-known architect here increasingly, and incorporates a number of um, literally uh, steel, uh, recycled steel into the structure. But that may or may not happen. But what I'm curious about, though, is in this, could you, could you walk us through a little bit of, do, does this reflect something about the heritage piece and some of the issues that you have? Actually, I love Jeannie Gang's work. I wanted to hire her as the architect, but um, uh, we hired ENIAD architects out of New York City. They've done a lot of additions onto older buildings and, uh, in a manner. Uh, we told them that we didn't want a new wing attached to an old building. They had to deal with the old building, too. So uh, thank you for that question. Um, 
We uh, opened, as I said, in 1959 in a Georgian style building. It was a brand new building then, but it was built in Georgian. So um, it actually had four large columns here. We're also about three blocks up on a hill from the courthouse in the largest county of Pennsylvania. And so everybody thought we were a courthouse annex because we look like a government building. And when we started the campaign, um, one uh, uh, a press person asked one of my colleagues, you know, well, what do you really want to achieve um, in this new building? And she said, I don't want to get the courthouse's mail anymore. <laughs> so that was one thing. But we wanted to look like a, a building of the 21st century. We wanted to look like an art museum. Uh, and uh, the materials are going to be of the area. Um, the cantilever here is actually zinc, uh, which is not a material uh, natural to Pennsylvania, but the articulation across it is steel. Uh, and then the brise across it is aluminum. Uh, we have brick, we have stone. Um, all of the plantings in front of the building are indigenous Pennsylvania plants. We only have a little bit of, of mowed lawn. Uh, so we're creating this uh, parklet in front of it also. Um, so we are trying to uh, use as many materials from the heritage of the area. And um, our architects looked at a lot of our collection before they designed the building. And the cantilever, which everyone says, oh, of course, because you're you know, 30 miles from falling water, Frankwood, right? The cantilever really alludes more to bridge structure. Um, than, it, than it does to, to falling water. And so you can see they're trying to even articulate the structure that you can see that occurred in, in lots of Pittsburgh bridges. So we, we are trying to make a statement um, with the building. Can you say a quick word about the fire? Oh, yes. So as a museum, we're always looking for ways to support ourselves. Oh, thank you. And um, so we, <laughs> when, we, uh, when we did this project, we got some funding uh, from a, a local Pittsburgh foundation to create documentation about it. So we created this um, box set, which I'll leave here. And um, you can fight over it or put it someplace good. I also have order forms in, can, in case you can't resist. It is you know, close to the holidays and all. Anyway, uh, this is the catalog of our collection. Um, we have a, a, an article by um, a professor in Pittsburgh on the steel industry, and then our steel our chief curator wrote about the uh, art. We partnered with a, um, a, a filmmaker in Boston who became interested in telling the history of Pittsburgh steel through our paintings, obviously wrapping uh, some other groups. Rivers of Steel is in there. Uh, so there's a DVD uh, in there. Then we also partnered with a musical group and asked them to research the songs of the Steel era, which they did, and they updated them a little bit. Um, but we have, to have a musical um, CD in here um, that is, is really wonderful. So and if you are interested, um, I have some information on it. It did really well for us, um, continues to do. I will also add that when we exhibited the entire collection of Steel uh, pictures, we had 85% male audiences in the building, <laughs> which is a total reversal of what we usually do, and a lot of them were wearing ball caps with U.S. steel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judy. Um, that is a huge mirror that should be held up to the work here, and we will definitely want to be exploring what that really means and, and the ways that you've done it and how you focus the story. I mean, there's, there's many things to be learned. Judy can stay uh, through lunch, I think, and I, I hope that people who uh, are so inclined can come uh, pick her brain. Uh, we will have a 15-minute break, but I, I wanted to say that right after that break, then, we're going to reflect on this from a couple of different perspectives, um, both uh, making of art, of working on the business side um, and uh, making networks and we have a, a panel of folks who will, will walk us through that. Um, at the end of the day, we have uh, Pat Wisniewski is going to um, sort of reflect on some things from the day and there's a documentary being produced right now called Shifting Sands, a 
about the region that I think is um, a really good uh, counterpart to what we just heard from Judy here in terms of how a region has gone through a great story of transformation in many ways and yet is, is still uh, working on remembering even as it imagines. Um, so I just wanted to uh, call those out and of course in the afternoon we'll go look at this landscape in some really key places. So uh, 15 minutes uh, we'll start again and uh, the coffee is still here as are the dangers right there.